activist for social justice all his life. Uh, while still in his teens, he's battled apartheid in South Africa in the 1970s and 80s through the Helping Hands Youth Organization. Thereafter came his global campaigns to end poverty and uh, protect human rights. He's made significant strides for positive change in his leadership roles as chair of the Global Call for Climate Action, founding chair of the Global Call to Action Against Poverty, and Secretary General and CEO of Civicus, uh, which is the last time that I interviewed him um, and the World Alliance for Citizen Participation. In 2009, he joined and led Greenpeace. And now he heads one of the world's largest non-governmental rights groups, Amnesty International. In appointing him, the chair of the Amnesty Board said his vision and passion for just, a just and a peaceful world makes him an exceptional leader. His appointment as Secretary General took effect August this year. And on the agenda, we are now honored to welcome Kumi Naidu. Thank you so much for making the time. We know since your appointment, you're always in transition now. Well, thank you, and it's a pleasure to be with you and your viewers. We've been trying to get this interview since the appointment. Do you feel like the work you've been doing, the activism work you've been doing since you were a teenager, was preparing you for this role? Well, even though it was uh, not by design, yeah. it was sort of accidental, uh, I think the involvement in the struggle against apartheid taught me the most valuable things that I hold. I mean, I jokingly remind people that my first march when I was 15 in 1980 during the National Student Uprisings, the slogan was, uh, we were chanting at the front of the march was, we want equality. Yeah. By the time the slogan got to the back of the march, the younger kids were chanting, we want a color TV. <laughs> because kids in white schools had color TVs and kids in black schools yeah, had no yeah. TV. But, but you know, even though a simple experience like that, you might think it's irrelevant, but it did teach me that it's okay when you choose to stand up for justice, that it's okay to get things wrong. Because those in power, those in business, those in government and all, daily get things wrong and yeah. there's no accountability. Why should those who are standing up to resist injustice not have also the license to get things wrong every now and then? For example, instead of saying we want equality, saying we, we want, want the color TVs. TV, exactly. it's okay. Yeah. <laughs> as long as we have that support. Yeah. And, and by the way, I think when I was 15, I wanted equality and a color TV almost. As equally. well. <laughs> <laughs> what has kept you consistent though? You've stuck to the message. I think the main thing that has helped me to stay true to the cause has been the fact that I was blessed to have met during the liberation struggle many amazing fellow activists. Uh, I can give you a long list of people who inspired me, but if I might just take two. Uh, Lenny Naidu was my best friend. He was murdered by uh, the Flak Plus unit of Eugene de Kock and over three young women from Durban. In fact, I, I was just in Durban now for a fundraiser yep. event. We were expecting to uh, talk to you from Durban. From Durban, yeah. yes. And, uh, and you know, he, uh, he was brutally murdered by the regime in 1988 and he always used to say uh, this, the, the biggest contribution you can make to the struggle is not giving your life but giving the rest of your life. Oh wow. Right? Because see if Mugabe died in 1981 everybody would have remembered that him on with a you. very positive side of history but 33 years later there's a more complicated reading. Yeah. The real test even for our leaders now in South Africa is whether they can resist the petty temptation of more and more material things for themselves when the vast majority Less of our people more. cannot uh, uh, you know feed their children cannot get health care cannot have education and so on so that uh, inspiration was big the other was a woman from Durban from Komashu uh, uh, we called her Zandi um, Pila Ndwandwe, her name was. In fact, if you go to the Constitutional Court, there's a display of her body in, a, in checkers packets because yeah. when they captured her from Swaziland and tortured her. That's what she was wearing. Right? No, they kept her naked. And to have some dignity, Pila would take uh, you know, those packets. So when they went to discover her body, the policemen who put it, they said, ah, yeah, there's those plastic over her bones. That's how they knew. So Pila and Lenny, two out of many examples I can quote you, say to us that we ask of our leaders today much less than we asked of the Pilas, 
the Solomon Mashlangus and so on of the previous era. We're not saying you have to go and sacrifice your life as many did during the liberation struggle. Yeah. All we're saying yeah. to our leaders now, don't steal. Do what you say uh, at election times and, 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 and be true to the history and the message of Mandela and what the liberation struggle was all yeah. about. The liberation struggle was not about simply getting a vote. The liberation struggle was about ensuring decent education, health, housing and so on. Why is it so difficult to uphold ethics at the power level? Because I think today the most powerful disease we're dealing in the world is probably not HIV AIDS, cancer or even uh, influenza. The most imp powerful disease is one we could call affluenza. It's a pathological illness where people have yeah. been led to believe that real meaningful happiness and a decent life comes from more, more, more acquisitions of yeah. things you don't need. And the problem we have is our political leaders uh, are also like leaders all over the world. And by the way, it's not only the rich that are afflicted by the affluenza disease, it's also the poor because that's been made the, the aspiration. The ones who are trying to project the something aspiration. that isn't there. Yeah, so, so when you ask me why, I feel sad. You know, I've been very critical of many of our political leaders yeah. uh, for corruption and so on. But there's a part of me that feels really sad for them. I see them as sick people. I think, how can you steal that amount of money on the one hand and say that you are for the people and you're for the poor and so on? There must be something mentally really messed up in you yeah. for you to maintain that posture and be able to live with yourself. We're speaking to Kuminaidu and we're encouraging you to also be part of the conversation. You can send us your video or voice notes on 0817328421. You can also call in if you have a specific, a, directed, a direct question that you want to ask him at star 27117146841. We're celebrating you and we're telling people that we, we, we're happy that you have this new position. But outside of the uh, uh, NGO space, some people, ordinary South Africans, might not know who Amnesty International is. Tell us about that. So, you know, Amnesty is the largest human rights movement in the world. It's one of the first. Uh, its slogan is fighting bad guys since 1961 when it was set up. Mm. It has had a track record of taking on things that were very unpopular. And uh, like, for example, the death penalty. When Amnesty took a position decades ago that death penalty was inhumane, didn't serve a pop proper pers yep. purpose, too many innocent people were getting killed and so on. Um, it was a very unpopular position to take. Uh, and today, more than 106 countries in the world actually support that. But Amnesty is about protecting all of human rights. That is women's rights, workers' rights, the rights of indigenous peoples, the rights of uh, minorities, uh, LGBTI rights, uh, and so on. And for us, we don't care which government it is. We are completely neutral politically in the sense that we would be as critical of uh, a government that is um, pro-capitalist or pro-socialist, say. Yeah. But, but if they are, we don't care about exactly how they operate uh, generally, but if they are violating um, human rights and if they are violating, we will take them uh, equally. And, um, and I should just say to people that I was panicking about whether to accept the position or not, right? Because to us it might seem like a big deal, but you had been interacting with them throughout your activism work as well. Yeah, yeah. And, and to be honest, after I came back from Greenpeace, and I was working on trying to convince President Zuma and the ANC not to continue with the nuclear deal. And I'm glad that the nuclear deal is hopefully history and so Off on. the plate. And I was not planning to go back to global activism because this, I, I've been working more on the African continent, building a new African-wide social movement called Africans Rising for Justice, Peace and Dignity over the last two and a half years. And when Amnesty approached me, I was like, Oh, I, I'm, I'm, I really don't want to, Here we go again. To, 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 to get back in a suitcase and traveling around the world. But I had a meeting at the Nelson Mandela Foundation that morning after, you know, like coming close to the day I had to make a decision. A decision. So I arrived earlier for this uh, uh, ANC stalwarts and veterans meeting. 
and I put my computer on and there were five emails that had come all from Amnesty and I literally did this. I said, oh my God, this is getting serious. <laughs> and then I looked on the left, there was a portrait of Madiba. On the right, there was a landscape of Africa and in front of me, there was a tiny little if thing which I couldn't see. If ever there was see. a sign. So I walk up to it. Oh my word. And you know what it was? It was a letter that Madiba wrote to Amnesty in 1962 Okay. Thanking them. Goosebumps stuff. For exactly. I, I was like, oh okay, the word. old man saying I must do this. And when they asked me, when I went for the interview, they said, so why? You okay. have so many Can options. Why did you call? take this? I said, Madi Bas. We have Lungelo on the line. Lungelo, thank you so much for making the call. What do you have to say to Kumi? Good morning, SABC. How are you? We're well, thank you. I'm fine. Can't complain. Eh? Uh, I just want to ask uh, to Mr. Kumi in particular with regards to the SADC and the AU region, né? Uh, what are they doing in particular to curb all the corruption that is basically happening in the African states, in particular your South Africa, Zimbabwe, DRC, and uh, those uh, major countries in particular that are being looted every day, uh, day in, day out. What is basically those two organizations doing? And also, what is Amnesty International are they also doing on their side? Thank you very much. Thanks, Lungelo. So thank you very much, Lungelo, for that question. Um, we have strengthened and continue to strengthen our pres uh, presence and activism on the African continent. So we now have uh, four regional offices, Southern Africa, East Africa out of Nairobi, uh, the Southern Africa office is out of Joburg, uh, Western Central Africa around Dakar, and then the, for North Africa and the Middle East, we have a presence both in Beirut and in Tunisia. So uh, we are strengthening our on the ground presence. In terms of uh, where our focus in is exactly the issues that you have uh, highlighted. Uh, let me just say that there's also some like quite hidden issues in Southern Africa that my colleagues in uh, that have taken up, for example, the discrimination against uh, women who suffer from albinism, yeah. right? In Malawi, for example, we've done a whole not so, study. Not so much a big issue here, but a bigger issue in the rest of the continent. Yeah. yeah. So, so, you know, we took out a hidden issue, highlighted it, and we're getting government action on it. In Madagascar, the conditions of uh, people awaiting uh, a trial in prison is horrendous. We brought out a report on that. So basically, there are several issues. But, but I think I would say that for Africa, uh, as the Africans rising for justice, peace, and dignity argue, the, the social movement, um, our only hope to lift this continent out of the misery that history has thrown at us is for us to recognize that we need maximum social, economic, and political unity. I mean, uh, I've been jokingly saying now, for ever since Europe adopted a euro, I said if Europe can have a euro, I don't see why Africa can't have an afro. And uh, <laughs> I'm not talking about the beautiful hairstyle here. Yeah? I'm talking we about can use one, it both ways. one, <laughs> one common uh, uh, currency. And 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 I was happy to see President yeah. Ramaphosa at the last AU meeting picked up the idea because unless we have that level of, of thinking. Uh, thinking and ambition. Rich countries and the powerful blocks in the world will continue to kick us around like political footballs yeah. depending on their global geopolitical. I know bits. you're itching to get to the issues, but I really want to go back to that moment that you were talking about earlier before we took the call. Just complete that conversation for us. Yeah, no, no. I, 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 was, like, I was alone in the Nelson Mandela boardroom and I was like... Uh, I was like wanting to say to somebody, hey, I'm dealing with this big dilemma. <laughs> and, 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 and look, Madiba, and, and, and the relationship between Amnesty and Madiba is not entirely uh, uncontroversial because yeah. Amnesty uh, uh, defends people who engage as in will, peace. As will happen with what you were saying earlier, that yeah. you commit mistakes along the way. Yeah, so, so Amnesty has always held the view of, yes, resist injustice, resist it forcefully, but resist, resist it yeah. through peace, peaceful means. So the fact that Madiba was then subsequently... Uh, you know, convicted for uh, armed struggle, that created a little bit of, you know, how much could Amnesty associate with. But I'm happy to say that uh, Amnesty gave Madiba its highest award, um, the Ambassador of Conscience Award, a couple of 
years after he was released from prison. We have Dr. Kulegile Shasha who's calling from Cape Town. Dr. Shasha, what's on your mind this morning? Yes, um, good, I, good day. I, I believe it's from Queenstown. Yes. Yes, it's from Queenstown. Good, good morning, and good morning to your guest, uh, Mr. Kumi Naidu, um, General Secretary. Good morning. Uh, I just wanted to express my uh, gratitude to the work that is being done by Amnesty um, International, and also to actually say to them that um, I myself have, have worked at the university structure for Amnesty uh, International as a student back in 2004. And what we realized was that um, we were very disappointed with the African continent's uh, reluctance to actually um, take head on the, the difficulties that they face when they are having dictatorship organizations and dictatorship governments that don't want to fall out um, and, and give uh, power to the ground and to the people, to like let it trickle down and to forgive the sins of the past. So we end up actually living in our own chains. And, um, as a medical doctor, I believe that we, we need to continue having hope Naidu is saying that they are working, I like how he expresses the, the ground, to say that we are ground. All right, we lost that line with Dr. Shasha, but do you, you get the gist of yes, no, uh, being very Dr. complimentary? Is, is like millions of people around the world, right, who are a critical part of amnesty in the sense, because the backbone of amnesty is not people, people. like myself. Yeah. But I'm full-time, I'm 24-7, but actually, I'd like to use this opportunity to extend a very warm welcome to any citizen across the continent and across the world who might be visiting. Who wants uh, to come along on this journey? Come, come join, because right now, all of us have a simple choice, right? We either be part of the problem or we be part of the solution. Yep. And taking the option of neutrality in the face of so much of threat to our children and their children's futures, Close sadly, the is... is an option of being part of the problem. So we, uh, of course, there are many ways people can contribute, and if people have ways to contribute, great. But uh, Amnesty offers a home you can find I us online. I think that needs to be repeated. Yeah. If you take the stance of neutrality, you are inadvertently becoming part of Absolutely. The I mean, you problem. can't be neutral. Yeah. When the climate scientists tell us, as they did six weeks ago, that humanity has 12 years to get emissions to peak and start coming down yeah. before we're on the road to extinction, then surely we have to wake up and say, come on, we cannot be business as usual. Yeah. And it cannot be activism as usual either. Kumi, that six weeks ago you're talking about is a Human Climate Change Conference, uh, COP24. I was wondering in my head, um, when these events happened, or you're probably talking about a different one, ha have you removed yourself from the conversation about climate change now that you, you have another conversation that's running? No, no, th th thank you for asking that, because that's the first thing we have to break, right? Part of the problem we are, part of the reason we're in such deep crisis right now is that political systems have been built in based of silos, health, education, human rights, poverty, environment, and so on. The women's movement long time ago gave us a very powerful concept, but a terrible word, intersectionality. Yeah. Right? If you want to advance, for example, gender equality, to understand bring everything to the how table. gender intersects with race, class, ability, and so on. Yeah. Similarly, I have argued that the struggle to always struggle address with human rights, <laughs> <laughs> the struggle to avert uh, catastrophic climate change and the struggle to uh, address human rights can and must be seen as two sides of the same coin. The head of the global trade union movement, a woman called Sharon Burrows, said to the, the Secretary General of the UN a couple of years ago, while she was like, uh, you know, passionately talking about climate change, she said, you know, Secretary General, you might be wondering why me as a trade unionist who has to talk f for decent work and better working conditions, why I have to address the climate change issue? She said, Secretary General, because as a mother, as a human being, and as a trade unionist, I recognize, quote, there are no jobs on a dead planet, unquote. To if there are no jobs on a dead planet, there are no human beings on a dead planet, there are no human rights on a dead planet. So therefore, 
climate change is fundamentally a human rights issue. A funny one came to mind now, Oprah Winfrey uh, quoting Maya Angelou saying, whenever she walks into a meeting where she is the only woman in the meeting, she always remember, I come here as one but I am with the masses. We're talking to Kumi Naidu, newly appointed Secretary General of uh, Amnesty International, the very first African to do so. Second. Is it the second? Yeah. Pierre um, Sane from Senegal okay. was there about All two right, years we, ago. thanks for that correction. We got be too excited and we're wanting to be number one up there, but we're encouraging our viewers to call us on uh, plus 27117146841 to have the conversation with us, or you can send us your WhatsApp voice or video notes on 081 732 8421. Let's take a break right now.